The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward. They did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his, what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And the flood of, after the flood of Noah, so after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. This is the word of our Lord. You please be seated. Let's pray again together. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, we thank you that um, in this passage, we see more of, of blessing and cursing. We, we see more of, of your relationship with your covenant people. Lord, we thank you as we, we look at, at this passage, we see a warning. Lord, against walking in unrighteousness and walking in sin as, as sin will have its consequences. But Lord, we also see an encouragement and for embedded in this, in this, in this we see a promise of blessing. And Lord, we pray that, that all of the people here would, would turn to Christ and receive the blessing that can only come in and through him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I heard some painful news about a well-known preacher who had committed immorality and was removed from church leadership. It was shocking. I'm used to that sort of thing from false teachers, but this was a man of the word. This was the, a man who, who I had had as a professor. In my mind, he was one of us. It was heartbreaking. I shed tears over this man's sin. But I can't imagine how the people who were closest to him must have felt, how they, they feel even now. People in his church, his elders, his wife, his children. Our sins have consequences, sometimes devastating consequences. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 24, the sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. We can be sure of this as Numbers 32, 23 warns, be sure your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. The world had become so wicked that the Lord had wiped out everyone apart from Noah and his family in a global flood. The flood was over. Noah and his family and the animals had come off the ark. Noah had made his sacrifice. The Lord had established his covenant. And we might be wondering, well, what's going to happen next? Think about how bad the world had gotten by the, by the time the flood came. What's, what's going to happen? Is it going to go better this time? We don't have to wait very long to find out. This morning, we're going to be hearing about Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Earlier, we had seen them blessed by God, recipients of God's covenant promises. However, this passage reveals that, not is all, that all is not as it seems. This passage serves as a brief but important transitional unit tying the Toledot of Noah to the Toledot of the sons of Noah. 
It reveals the characteristics of the three major branches of humanity's family tree. In the sons of Noah, the two seeds are represented. The two seeds that we've been talking about ever since Genesis 3, that's the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And given the framework that, that we've seen in the progress of redemption history, it's, it's becoming even clearer who the two seeds are. The seed of the covenant and the seed of the curse. Verses 18 and 19 provide an introduction to the narrative. It picks up on the genealogy of Seth that began in Genesis 5.3, but broke away at the end of that chapter to describe the events surrounding the flood. And in this passage, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are the principal actors in this drama. Noah's action provides an occasion for the sin and, and also an occasion for obedience. In verse 18, we are, we're also reminded, so we're also introduced of another name, to another name, Canaan. Canaan, the son of Ham, whose descendants will play a prominent and very negative role in the biblical history of Israel. So in verse 19, we, we see that Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are, are together the forefathers of the entire human race. Again, this prepares the way for the next Toledot, the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It runs from, from 10.1 to 11.9. And, and the dominant feature of that Toledot, as we're going to see next week, is the, the table of nations that, that, that delineates all of the peoples of the world. So verse 20. We, we see that, that Noah has settled down and planted a vineyard. And Noah was once a man of the water, and now he's a man of the soil. And once again, as, we, as we've seen previously, there, there are many parallels between Noah and Adam. Adam is made from the soil. Noah is a man of the soil. Both are gardeners. There's going to be other important parallels, as we'll see as the story progresses. As an aside, it's interesting that the first vineyards are thought to have originated in, guess where? Armenia, where the ark landed. Very interesting. And so Noah plants a vineyard, and then he, he samples the fruits of his labors. He, he drinks some of the wine which his grapes had produced. Now, so far, Noah hasn't done anything wrong. Drinking alcohol is not specifically condemned in Scripture. Wine was used in ancient Israel to gladden the heart, Psalm 104.15, and to ease pain, Proverbs 31.6. Yet Noah doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with a little alcohol. In a shocking reversal of what we have seen from Noah so far, he gets drunk. Now drunkenness is clearly sinful. Noah gets fall down, passed out, naked on the ground, drunk. And that's what the, the Hebrew communicates here, that, that he actually is so drunk that he uncovers himself. Now Noah's drunkenness was shameful in itself, but it was, it, it, this drunkenness led to and was compounded by his nakedness. Now some would say that, that, that Noah was naive in, in getting drunk, and that he, did, he didn't know the effects of wine, so, so he can't be blamed. Now it's true that the scriptures don't directly uh, condemn or condone his behavior. But, but, in, but I think there's two things that we need to see here. First of all, Noah's, Noah's actions aren't the main point of the story. Noah's actions, as I mentioned earlier, provide the, the, the backdrop, they, they provide the occasion for, for the, the really glaring sin that, that's about to take place. But secondly, while Noah is not directly criticized for his behavior, these two degrading effects of the abuse of alcohol, drunkenness and nakedness, are clearly condemned in Scripture again and again and again. And so Noah's nakedness here provides another parallel between him and Adam. Adam, was disgra Adam disgraced himself by his sin and became aware of his nakedness. Noah was oblivious to his nakedness, and both needed covering. 
Some skeptics say that, that drunk Noah is such a stark contrast with righteous Noah that we've read about earlier that these two accounts are, are incompatible and that one or, or both of them must be wrong. But that is to ignore the larger biblical testimony. The heroes of the Bible are flawed heroes. Abraham, the patriarch of patriarchs, lies and puts his lies repeatedly and puts his wife's virtue at risk in order to save his own neck. Moses, the giver of the law, commits murder and fails to honor God as holy. David, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery and murder. Peter, the leader of the apostles, commits repeated acts of cowardice. The heroes of the Bible are all flawed heroes, that is, except for one. There's really no such thing as a great man, only a great God. And this is further, further internal evidence for the truth of God's word that it, it doesn't gloss over the, the weaknesses of, of many of the, the, the men of the Bible. But whether Noah had any naivete about, about the effects of alcohol or, or not, we, we can't make any such claim. We know the effects of alcohol. Many of us know personally the debilitating effects of alcohol. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bible to Proverbs uh, 23, verses 29 to 35. Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. Its end, in its end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. Now, in my, in my unrepentant sinning days, I experienced this. I don't know of, of a better description anywhere of what it's like to be, to be drunk and to be a slave to alcohol than this passage. Alcohol it is a very, very dangerous drug. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, a strong drink, a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. But 1 Corinthians 6.10 provides an even more dire warning. Drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. We must not be mistaken about the dangers of alcohol. Young people, that the time is going to come when somebody is going to offer you a drink or, or something else in the, the culture that we're going even, even worse than alcohol. You need to set in your heart and your mind now saying, I, I've read Proverbs. I don't want this. I don't want to be a slave to this. Now again, in the scriptures, drunkenness is the sin. Uh, moderate use of alcohol is not sinful. But you must be very, very careful. There, there, nobody who is an alcoholic set out to become an alcoholic. I spoke several weeks ago about, about my friend who was drinking rubbing alcohol. He didn't suddenly wake up one day and said, I'm going to drink rubbing alcohol. It started with one drink and he, he gradually, through the, the course of his life and his wicked choices, became more and more in bondage to alcohol. In this passage, Noah's sin, and I, I believe it is sin, Noah's sin here provides the occasion for, for the cursing of his offspring. Noah should have known better. He made choices that had consequences for generations. But again, Noah's drunkenness is, is not the main point of this narrative. It, it provides the occasion for what follows. 
So there is, is Noah, drunk, unconscious, naked on the floor. It's an ugly picture, but it is about to get a whole lot worse. Enter Ham. Genesis 9, 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Again, we see Ham as presented as the, the father of Canaan. He sees his drunken father passed out on the ground and gawks at him. Now there's speculation as to what happened and, and some would say that, that lust was involved but, but I, I don't believe from the context here that lust was, that was actually a factor. Ham's failure to honor his father was enough. And Ham's role here is, is, is likened to that of the serpent who played a, a key role in the discovery, uh, in Adam's discovery of his nakedness and was cursed for his deed. But as if that wasn't bad enough, Ham didn't just leave Noah exposed, he exposed his exposure, telling it to his brothers. Something like, like, look at the old man. There he is, drunk and, and unconscious on the floor. What a, what a spectacle. It's, it, it, friends, you, you're not supposed to rejoice even if your enemy falls, let alone your own father. Ham should have at least looked away. He, he should have at least kept his mouth shut. But in an act of brazen disloyalty, he fractures the fifth commandment, dishonoring his father. And it doesn't matter that the commandments hadn't been written in stone yet. He knew full well that this was wrong. Dishonoring, dishonoring your parents didn't become wrong in Exodus 20. It was always wrong and will always be wrong. 1 Timothy 5.1 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as you would a father. Now, I wonder how many people in our culture would, would even know what it, what it means to, to exhort a father properly. There's a common temptation to, to dishonor those in authority, whether it be state, church, or parental authority. How do you respond when, when someone in authority falls? Do you grieve for them and grieve for those who are under their leadership or, or do you delight in it and do you, you spread the news? Now, I'm, I'm not a Trump supporter, but, but I shake my head at the way he is presented in the media and the way I hear so many people, even, even professing Christians, speaking about him. In the movie... MacArthur, it's not about John MacArthur, it's about General Douglas MacArthur. There's a scene in which President Truman, I've, I've used this illustration before, there's a scene in which President Truman flies to Korea concerned about MacArthur's rogue activities. And when Air Force One arrives in Seoul, th there should have been an honor guard waiting for the president. But MacArthur isn't even there. He, he makes the president wait uh, on the tarmac for a long time before even showing up. And President Truman then, then says something that I've, I've often thought about afterwards. The president said, he could do that to Harry Truman, the man, but he can't do that to the commander-in-chief. In other words, MacArthur should have respected the office of the president. Another example, there's a, there's a lot of things about, about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that, that he does that, that, that I, I'm troubled with, that I disagree with, but, but I must respect the office of the Prime Minister. Now, young people, adult children, we're all here as children. Most of us have parents who are still alive. Your father may have done things and may do things you disagree with but you must respect him as your father. Respect him as your father. May all of us honor the Lord by honoring those in authority over our lives. Ham failed miserably at this and there would be consequences, serious consequences that would continue for generations. More on that shortly. Shem and Japheth, in verse 23, in stark contrast to their brother, took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backwards into the tent 
and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. The, the narrative is, is slowing right down here and, and, and taking using great detail to describe just how careful these brothers were to honor their father. And everything that they do is meant to, to show the, the darkness of what Ham had done. They respectfully cover their eyes and cover their father. And so Shem and Japheth are really the antithesis of Ham against the backdrop of, of his sin. Their act of, of mercy and honor shine that much more brightly. But now in verse 24, Noah sobers up. He wakes from his wine and knows what Ham had done to him. The text doesn't say how he found out, just that he knew. And now Noah speaks. This, this is the first and only recorded speech from Noah in the whole Bible. Verse 25, he says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. Now we've seen several curses in Genesis as a result of the fall. Uh, against the serpent for tempting Eve in 3.14. Against the ground because of Adam's sin in 3.17. Against Cain for killing his brother in 4.11 and 12. But this is the first time in scripture that a curse is uttered by a man. And it is Noah cursing a member of his own family. Now this should shock you. It probably does, but, but very likely not in the way that it would have shocked the original recipients of the Torah. You may be thinking, wow, that's pretty harsh. Ham does just one little thing wrong. And here his, his son and, and all of the generations of, of that son are, are cursed. But Israel understood, at least in principle, how serious and how wicked Ham's actions were. They, they understood that anyone who dishonored their father or mother was to be cursed, Deuteronomy 27, 16. And they understood that under Old Testament civil law, a stubborn and rebellious son was to be stoned to death, Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. So what would have been shocking for the people who first received this instruction and this, this story was how far Ham had fallen and how fast. Here we have one of the three forefathers of the human race behaving so wickedly that his son, Canaan, and all of Canaan's offspring are cursed. They're cursed to become servants of servants, or literally slaves of slaves, the lowest, most abject of slaves. As you look at this curse, you, you might also be troubled by the one who is cursed. Why is Canaan cursed and not Ham? Now, a lot of ink has been spilled trying to explain this, and some commentators go so far as to say that, that this is an error. That it really, wasn't, it really wasn't Ham who dishonored Noah, but Canaan. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all con considering what's presented there in the, in the rest of the, of the context of this passage and even in the biblical account. There are four main explanations given that, that are faithful to the inerrancy of God's word and each of them has merit. First, God has just blessed Ham earlier in the chapter. And Noah can't revoke that blessing. We need to understand here that, that when, when Noah curses Canaan, that this curse is a request. N Noah's words aren't, aren't magical so as to control the destinies of, of future generations. God had intended to bless Ham and to curse Canaan. And so what, what Noah says here is a prophetic oracle declaring what God is going to do. God is sovereign. You do not need to be afraid of someone laying a curse on you. Proverbs 26, 2 says, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flight, a curse that is causeless does not alight. I know in, in some cultures, I've, I've talked to people about this in, in Vanuatu and, and Papua New Guinea, that that, that uh, sometimes the, the, the village witch doctor will, will point a bone at somebody and, and that person will die. And, and so the, the, the people in the village are living in fear of, of these witch doctors. But the witch doctor has no power. The only, only power that, that they receive is, is, is what is, is given to them. 
in the, in the fear of the people. And so the, a witch doctor can't, can't cause somebody to die unless God allows that that, that, that person would die. This is, not, this is not because the witch doctor has any kind of authority in the, in the heavenly places. Quite the opposite. Second, the reason why Canaan is, is cursed and not Ham is an example of, of lex talionis that we've seen repeatedly that the consequence fits the crime. So Ham, Noah's youngest son, humiliated him. And now Ham, Canaan's youngest son, would be humiliated. It's interesting that the name Canaan actually means to have to submit or, or to be humbled. Ham had caused a breach in his family. And now his offspring will live with the consequences of that breach. It's not primarily Cain, the individual who is cursed here, but it is the line of Canaan who is cursed. It is not only Canaan, but the Canaanites. It's also not all of the descendants of Ham as some wrongly interpret scripture, but specifically the line of Canaan. Furthermore, we, we need to remember something vitally important here. Something that would go a long way towards correcting the so-called racial tension that we're seeing in the U.S. Friends, there's only one race, the human race. And all people are descended from these three brothers. The difference between the, the seed of the covenant and the seed of the curse lies not in ethnicity, but in election. This comes through faith as a sovereign gift of God. The third reason why Canaan is blessed and er, is cursed rather and not Ham is, is most important to the immediate context. Noah's curse of Canaan foreshadows the relationship between the nations that come from the three brothers. And, and so this passage is very important as an apologetic for the subjection of Canaan to Israel. It serves as an explanation for what Israel would be called to do to Canaan. The sin of the Canaanites was, was so reprehensible that they would be vomited out of the land, Leviticus 18.25. And Israel was to be the means of that vomiting. They were to exterminate the Canaanites. This is a continuation of the war that we've been seeing throughout, this, throughout Genesis of this, the war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now the war between the, those of the, the seed of the covenant and those of the seed of the curse. And in this we're also being prepared for the, the next Toledot again in Genesis 10 and 11 and the introduction of Abram, the heir of Shem's blessing and recipient of the promises of Israel. Fourth and, and pertinent to us, this, this action predicts the character of the Canaanites. They were cursed not because of Ham's sin, but because of their own, because they acted like Ham. And so the Canaanites' character reflected that of their ancestor. Consider the, the description of, of the Lord that he gives of himself in, in Exodus 34, 7. Where he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So here we have with, with the Canaanites, the sins of the fathers being visited on the sons, to the third and the fourth generation and beyond. Commentator Alan Ross explains, a later generation may be judged for the sin of an ancestor if they are of like mind and deed. And so, so, so again, think about the context. This is given to Israel as they're about to enter the promised land. And so this serves as a warning. Just like the other books of the Torah. They're about to encounter the Canaanites. And now in the mind of Israel, Canaan is now escapably associated with sin and with the corruption from their ancestor, Ham. And so Leviticus 18 that I, I spoke of earlier, in that passage we, we see a warning for Israel against the practices, the vile practices of the Canaanites. Verses 6 to 18 reveal that the, the sin of the Canaanites is an abhorrent amplification of the sin of Ham. The very sin 
exposing the, the nakedness of their father, and then the, the Canaanites are taking that to, to, to exponentially worse sins. But even by the time of Abraham, whose, whose life overlapped Shem's, their wickedness was evident. Sodom and Gomorrah were populated by the offspring of Canaan. Those were Canaanites in those cities. Their, their sins progressed far beyond that of Ham. And so it's a warning that, that, that of, of what Canaan could do if, if Israel allowed themselves to be influenced by them. And, and we see throughout the scriptures that in the Old Testament that, that this negative influence corrupted and, and affected Israel. It took place from the time that Abraham crossed their borders. So this curse is a warning to Israel not to follow in their wicked footsteps. Listen, listen again to Alan Ross. People living in dark debauchery without any familial respect but only aggressive hubris are enslaved already by their lusts and are doomed for divine destruction. Being enslaved to their vices, the Canaanites were enslaved by others. Isn't that a sad indictment that we see on our own culture? So many around us enslaved by their vices. All of us here, apart from God's grace, enslaved to our vices, but set free by the blood of Christ. We have a warning here for us as well, that we need to beware of the sins of those around us, that the visible, it, the visible church is not immune to the effects of uh, the negative influence of the world. Francis Schaeffer, in a, in a statement that, that seems almost prophetic, says, or said, tell me what the world is saying today and I'll tell you what the church will be saying in seven years. Aren't we seeing that around us? As, as our, our culture has, has accepted vile and, and bizarre, wicked behavior, and it's, it's now becoming accepted in the visible church. But God's word never changes. We always need to come back to the plumb line to examine what God's word says is right, what God says is right, and what God says is wrong. But the curse wasn't the only thing on the lips of Noah that day. Verse 26, he also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So now we see the the curse followed by a blessing, which, which makes sense. But here, the, again, the recipient of the blessing might be surprising to you. You, you would probably expect, as, as I did, that, that, this, that Noah would say that, that Shem is blessed because of his obedience to, to, and his honoring of Noah. But it's not Shem directly. It's the Lord, the God of Shem, who is blessed. God is the divine actor and the... the uh, the, the sovereign behind Shem's behavior, behind Shem's obedience. And so by blessing the God of the man, the man and his progeny are blessed. So this is a blessing of Shem as the Lord, the God of Shem is blessed, as, as his greatest blessing is being associated with the Lord that he is now considered th th that God is his God. This is Shem's greatest blessing. We'll see shortly that, that Abraham descends from Shem. Israel, who enjoyed God's covenant blessings, are then heirs of this blessing. They are the seed of the promise. They are the seed of the covenant. And again, we see the relationship between the nations foreshadowed. The descendants of Canaan would be a slave to the descendants of Shem. This promise will be given in turn to Abraham in Genesis 15 as, as part of the covenant that God makes with him. And next, in, in verse 27, Noah also blesses Japheth. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and again let Canaan be his servant. So again, though, though Japheth, though he's not blessed directly, is given a favorable relationship with Shem and, and will enjoy protection by Shem, being under the covering of Shem. 
And God promises to enlarge him, to, to cause his progeny to expand. Yet again, we see somebody who is living up to their name because the name uh, Japheth means to make spacious. Now, Japheth has seven more sons and seven grandsons, and he is the ancestor, as I talked to about with the kids, of the, the various peoples who move into Europe. And, and as such, he's the ancestor of most of us here. But if you are here this morning as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of that blessing because the blessing comes to you through Shem, through Israel, through the descendants of Shem, one of whom is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So the Savior of, of Israel becomes the Savior of, of all peoples. Well, finally, in verses 20 and 20, 28 and 29, we come to the end of Noah's long life. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. He died just before the birth of Abraham. And this closes the genealogy of, of Seth and closes the Toledot of Noah that began in Genesis 6-9, but this is not the end of the story. The final colony of Canaanites would be wiped out by the Romans in the Battle of Carthage in 146 BC. But some of the Canaanites, as we see in the testimony of Scripture, were spared. Not all of Canaan belonged to Canaan. At least Rahab and, and some of her family Likely some of the Gibeonites and some of the Egyptians who left Israel with the Exodus and, and likely many others came to a true and living faith. A faith that God would, would send the Messiah to, to, to somehow to, to, to pay the penalty for their sins. The flood may have wiped all life off the face of the earth, but it could not wipe sin from the hearts of men. And similarly, the curse against Canaan could not wipe away God's electing grace. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 19, 23 to 25 envisaged a glorious day when, when Ham's descendants, Egypt and Assyria, would be reconciled to Shem's descendants, Israel. But we don't have to wait for a, for a future day. Again, we, we are seeing the effects of that, that even now. Turn with me in your, in your Bible to, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but look at, look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And this is the call of, of Abram. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. This is a continuation of the, the blessing that was, was on Shem. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. Now hear this. And in you all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Who does that point to? Who is the greatest descendant of, of Abraham? Who is the one in whom all of the families of the earth will be blessed? Jesus Christ, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so when you, when you, when you track ahead, you can, you can see that the gospel has, has gone forth into all the world. And we're already beginning to see that there are people from every tribe and tongue and nation, one race, but, but, but from every ethnos, every nation will, will be gathered together before Jesus Christ on that day. So yes, there was a, a curse on, on Canaan the descendants of Canaan. But God's blessing overcame that curse in Christ. In Christ, all of the families of the earth, even Canaanites, are blessed. Even you are blessed. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, as we look through the, these passages of Scripture and as, as we see vile and wicked deeds taking place, things that are shocking, Lord, we marvel at your sovereign grace. 
We marvel over the fact that, that you, Lord, are calling a people to yourself. L- Lord, that, that your blessing continues even to, to those who are Israel's enemies. And as we see that the, the lines of, of division are, are not between nations, but between those who are yours, between the people of the covenant and the people of the curse. Lord, we pray that they, you would help each one of us to, to become part of that covenant. Lord, that you'd help each one of us to turn to Christ and, and to, to be under the covenant in his blood. We ask that, that you would pour out your blessings on us as your people for the glory of your name and for the building of your church. Amen.